Hi, I am Magdalena Batrewska and you're watching Back at Home. For today's video, I have prepared for you the second prelude and fugue in C minor from the first book of J.S. Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier. As always, you will hear it played on a harpsichord and the piano, and then we will discuss it afterwards. <laughs> And now the same prelude and fugue played on the piano.
the C minor prelude and fugue tends to be the first prelude and fugue for many pianists. This video by nature will be dedicated to players who are new to the genre and it will hopefully help you explain the genre step by step. First of all, how do you distinguish a prelude from a few? Well, a prelude, as the name suggests, is actually a preamble of a sort. One used the prelude to warm up on the keyboard. Imagine arriving in a really cold weather to somebody's home and trying out their harpsichord for the first time. We must remember that the instruments were not as standardized as the modern piano. You are warming up your fingers with something of an improvisatory nature and the prelude serves perfectly for such purpose. Most preludes will be centered around one motivic idea, such is the case here. What is it really? What do we make of it? Well, it is nothing more than a chord with some so-called neighbor notes or neighbor toms. See, there are neighbors just popping in and out. But what I encourage you to do when you practice or when you're getting to know the piece is to play simply the chords by eliminating those neighbor toms, which will allow you to find the tension, the necessary dissonance and the same is the case with the previous prelude in C major, which opens the volume of Well-Tempered Clavier. In fact, Bach notates that first prelude in C major as blocked chords after a few measures of showing you how the pattern should work. So in this case we have chords and it is important to keep in mind when you practice to listen to the harmonic tensions within the piece. We are starting here on the tonic chord which is the home key here of C minor and here will be your most dissonant chord, therefore you may want to move your phrase right to it in order then to resolve it. On the piano, of course, you have this wonderful opportunity to create tone colors. of the content, of this rich content that Bach gives us here. Bach often employs what's called an implied polyphony. So in this piece, which seems just like a big mess of 16th notes, we actually uh, allow our ears to distinguish between two things, and that is this and that. rhythmic freedom has never hurt anyone in playing this prelude. I think that the last thing you want is for this piece to sound like sort of a perpetual mobile. There were plenty of pieces later on that were inspired by the Industrial Revolution and the sound of machines and the big cities, but it is not appropriate in the music of J.S. Bach to go there. Save that for when you're playing the Toccata of Prokofiev. Here, however, you want to make sure that you are speaking always and communicating. As you know, Bach was very well versed in the art of rhetoric, 
which is the art of speaking well and communicating to your listeners not only communicating but also moving their hearts and spirits in measure 21 you will find what's called a pedal point here in the pinking of the left hand you will notice that the g repeats <laughs> from a terminology of organ playing. A pedal point would have been something that involves the keyboard for an organist that is being played on by your feet. When we get to measure 28, Bach, who was known for giving us very little instruction as to the interpretation, is writing a whole new tempo indication, and that is presto. <laughs> Yes, we will be changing the entire character and the tempo. Please do not ever get caught in playing this. This will just sound awful and heartless. Think of it rather as a written out improvisation that Bach left us to learn from. Again, the rhythmic freedom here is very much appropriate and encouraged. After this, Bach changes the tempo indication one more time here in measure 34 to Adagio. If you talk to an Italian person about Adagio, they will tell you that it's not only a tempo indication, but rather a description of something that indicates freedom and invites freedom. Adagio, as one of my friends put it, is a me agio. It is the way I feel like playing this. And it gives me time to express myself. Look at this notation here of Bach. We have 32nd notes followed by 16th notes. You don't want to play metronomically. Think of it as a flourish. Don't practice it to be always the same. You, it, this will give you so much more freedom and fun in interpreting this music. Here also, we finally have one last tempo allegro here. And again, beware of the bar lines. You don't want to play. gestures. So do you remember, don't be fooled by the bar lines. They are there only for visual organization and mean very little in the phrasing of Johann Sebastian Bach's ever weaving, very baroque, very irregular melodies. We must remember that the word baroque comes from the irregularly shaped pearl and we must always look out for these irregular shapes in the melody. One last incredibly cool thing that Bach does here. Do you hear? Bach seems to be giving us a little sneak peek of the fugue opening motif. Let's talk about the fugue now. What is a fugue, first of all? 
Fugue is a genre that encompasses the strictest imitative polyphony. And what do I mean by imitative polyphony? First of all, polyphony involves many melodies, poly meaning many, that are coexisting in a piece and are of equal importance. Imitative polyphony is not an invention of the Baroque era. It was used plenty in the vocal music of the Renaissance. Motets and their secular cousins, madrigals, were full of imitative polyphony. Therefore, I really encourage you, as I always do, to listen to a lot of vocal music, if not by uh, Josquin or Palestrina or Monteverdi, to perhaps even Bach's own vocal music. For example, his B minor mass, which is abundant in polyphonic writing from the start. How can we tell a prelude from a few? Well, a few will always, without exception, start in a monophonic manner. That means single melody unaccompanied called a subject or a theme. It is always presented in a monophonic texture for the listener to register and remember the theme because the whole fun of the fugue is based on memorizing this material and then being able to recognize it later on. In this case, the fugue starts with this theme is the entire melody. The theme is then imitated in a higher voice and hence the imitative polyphony. We literally hear the answer to the initial subject. Is this next material. It is called a bridge. It is not thematic material which will help us link into the third iteration of the subject in the lowest voice. See this particular fugue is written in three voices and why do we even call them voices even though this is purely instrumental music? Well as I mentioned the fugue comes from a vocal tradition and those parts are still called voices until this day. So the bridge helps us make this transition. Now you may wonder, isn't this, isn't this the subject itself? Why do I call it non-thematic material? Well, what you're hearing are simply fragments of the subject and we refer to those as motifs. The term subject will only refer to a full melody that you hear presented at the beginning of a fugue in that monophonic texture. So when we finally arrive in measure seven, at the third voice presenting the subject, subjects in a three-part fugue. This means we have now completed the so-called exposition. If you're dealing with a fugue that has five voices, you will need to hear the subject five times. If a fugue has two voices, only two times are necessary to complete the exposition. What happens next is the so-called episode, which again contains the non-thematic material. Right? So we are playing around with these motifs, perhaps asking question and answering. And what you're hearing here is a sequence, which means the same material is repeated over and over a little bit lower. So this uh, episode is sort of a break in between the thematic section. The next time the theme appears is in measure 11. After which we plunge into yet another episode. 
Cusão. And now it is the middle voice, and that will be my thumb introducing the theme. It is very important when you prepare and practice a fugue that you know exactly where the themes start and end. Speaking of sequences, you will notice a new one coming up here in the middle of measure 18. And sure enough, it is a ascending sequence, which means the material will rise. There's often another very important element in the fugue. Don't you think the piece would have been perfectly fine ending right here? After all, we landed in the home key of C. Well, Bach is not quite done yet. He is inserting some bonus material and it is thematic material. what we refer to as coda, from an Italian word for tail. You will also notice that this fugue in C minor actually ends in a major. This is something that is done quite often in Bach's music and other Baroque music, and it is called a Picardy third, a major ending to a piece originally in a minor key. Let's talk a little bit about the interpretation of the piece, the very simple do's and don'ts. Of course, a lot in music is a very subjective matter, but there are perhaps some staples that are beyond debate and that can possibly help you practice this and other fugues. As you may remember from my previous videos, Bach was too busy to write a treatise. Luckily, his son, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, the so-called CPE Bach, wrote an essay on the true art of playing the keyboard instruments. And boy, does it really describe way more than just playing the keyboard instruments. He is giving us a little window into what his father did in terms of improvisation, playing basso continuo, ornamentation, and the general musicianship. Take this subject, for example. How are you supposed to know, in absence of any articulation or interpretational markings, how to play it, how to articulate it, how to make it speak? Luckily, CPE Bach gives us advice, and it is so simple. CPE Bach says you must first sing the melodic line in order to know how to play it on your instrument. You don't have to be an accomplished singer in order to be able to figure out the general flow of this subject. Even without getting the pitches right, you can probably do this. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. The way you roll your syllables as you sing will inform the way you should articulate this piece. This will help you eliminate the unnecessary accents and notice that the theme actually ends on this downbeat and it is the lightest part of the melody. If you ever hear this kind of playing, run the other way as quickly as you can. Notice that Bach's melodies hardly ever start on the actual downbeat. I cannot overemphasize the importance of paying attention to the melodic content. Here in measure 9, look at the left hand part. That is your melody and you have a new one. Here. See, what you don't want to do is it sounds just awful and your musicianship will suffer 
if this melody is inverted in the right hand part of measure 13. <laughs> now. While the right hand is doing that, the left hand is also playing against the beats. Listen also to the implied harmonic tension. And what do I mean by that? When you play your theme for the first time in monophony, Try to imagine the harmony that would normally go with it. Right. So we are talking about a more dissonant and consonant resolution. This will inform the level of tension which should exist in your playing. Perhaps more of a question. By the way, various treatises on playing the Baroque music mention playing the notes for only half of their actual written duration. You will never actually be playing this. Again, singing the melodic line will inform your way of playing it on the instrument in the most organic and natural way. The Pablo Casals principle is alive and well, especially here in these sequences. I am back in measure 18. Right? As we rise, we want the melody to feel more tension, which you may have heard about the so-called terrace dynamics of the Baroque music making. Uh, is only generally true. Within each dynamic level, there were many variations, as there are in speech. Variety was a key word in performing the Baroque music. A quick word about the long tied notes. As you will see here in the last three measures in the left hand, you have this really long C that is being tied over two bar lines. It is actually okay, and it would have been done in a harpsichord performance in order to prolong the sound to simply repeat that note. If you need to do that, it is perfectly acceptable. Now, is it okay to use pedal? in the music of J.S. Bach, yes, but don't make it too conspicuous. You may want to use pedal to connect some especially challenging legato passages when you feel like you're perhaps running out of fingers, but don't make it too obvious. On the other hand, you may have noticed that in a harpsichord performance, the sound blends a little bit more. The sound box of the harpsichord allows for that resonance to uh, last a little bit longer, creating some sort of a reverberation. So for all of you who are planning to play the music of J.S. Bach completely without pedal, this may also be some food for thought. If this is the first prelude and fugue that you have ever played, I wish you the best of luck and I very much hope that these ideas have been helpful to you. Do not forget to listen to a lot of vocal music of J.S. Bach and of course other composers. I always invite you to join me for the following sessions coming up on the Back at Home playlist. Thanks for being with me today. Stay well.